Okay. So last time we started talking about matrix norms, okay? And just like for vectors, we have norms to tell me something about matrices. And specifically, you already had a short question in your homework, which you probably investigated this, these slides to find the answer. What we actually will use matrix norms for is so-called condition numbers. And those condition numbers basically tell me how bad the system is in terms of solving it. Okay? So just as a recap, if you remember an L2 norm for vectors took squares of all of the vector elements and, uh, and then added them up and took a square root. Okay? And one norm that looks like two norm but is not two norm is so-called Frobenius norm. Okay? It does the same for matrix. So I basically take all of the elements, square them, and then I'm supposed to sum, sum them all up and take the square root. This is so-called Frobenius norm. Two norm for matrices is not that Frobenius norm. It's actually, it goes like this. I take all vectors okay, that have norm 1. Okay? So if I'm thinking that would be in three-dimensional, that would be all of the vectors that end on a sphere of radius 1 that point to the sphere. So then I take and look at where does a, when I multiply a times that vector, that's a new vector. Where's that vector? So maybe it's something that is like right here now. It goes from here to here. And then I'm actually looking at where did a send all of those vectors, and it's some shape. Okay? If I was on a sphere, I'm likely something like this, depending on what A does. Okay? It could be, for instance, if it's a simple, if A is diagonal matrix, 2, 2, 2, it's just going to multiply everything by 2. So sphere of radius 1 will go to sphere of radius 2, okay? for instance. So wherever those A sends those vectors, I look at their 2 norm, and I look at the maximum of it. And that's going to be my two norm on the matrix. So in the case of the diagonal matrix 2, 2, 2, okay, norm will be 2. Because all vectors of length 1 will go to a vector of length 2, because I've just multiplied all of the a vector elements vector. So that's, but overall, it's not necessarily something easy to compute. There are algorithms that, that do that. Okay. And then there are two other norms that are much easier to compute. One of them is a one norm. I'm going to, for every j, which is for every column, okay, I'm going to sum up all of the elements in that column, absolute value. Okay. And then I'm going to look at those sums. I have as many sums as I do columns. And I'm going to look at the maximum. And the maximum of that is my one norm. And if I do the same, I just go by rows, okay? So for every row i, I sum up all of the elements in that row. So a i one, i one, i two, i three, and so forth. Then I'm going to sum up absolute values, and the maximum of those sums is my infinity, okay? So those are fairly easy to compute. So for instance. Let's say this matrix A okay, was going to be norm 1. Norm 1 goes by columns. Okay. So I go 1 plus 4 plus 3 is 8. 2 plus 5 plus 2. 3 plus 6 plus 2. So what is the norm? 11. Okay. So that's my norm 1. And then here, I would do the same for inverse. So I can do the same for inverse. Can we do that quickly? So it's 19 over 3, or 15 over 3, or 4. So 19 over 3. Okay. So so-called condition number for this matrix is going to be 11 times 19 over 3 if computed in norm 1. This was done 
It's a good question. Uh, this was likely done in Frobenius. Okay. But it's norm one is easier to compute, so I'm not gonna do this by hand. Okay. Norm one is the addition of the column. Hmm? Norm one was the addition of the column. One is columns, infinity is rows. It will take the largest number that you get, right? Yeah, largest sum. So this would go by rows. So by rows it would be Maximum between 6, 15, and 7. So 15. Yes? Um, is, it, is it the same when you're calculating Gravenius? If you take the, like, like your Gravenius norm, you multiply the Gravenius of A inverse, you get a condition number. Or can you do Gravenius norm of A divided by the L1 norm? Of like whatever is the greatest out of each column, each of, of a inverse. Why would you do that? I don't know. I saw that. I get the exact same answer as I would have got if I Well, if I divide by any number, a fixed number, right? So if my entire matrix is divided by a fixed number, then uh, inverse of it will be multiplied by that fixed number. So basically, it's going to cancel each other in terms of norms. In terms of condition number. Okay, so you don't need it. Okay. All right. So why do we need actually condition numbers? Um, condition number is this, so. Before I move move on to that question, so question is which norm do you use? And does it matter? Technically, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're going to get a slightly different number, right? So for norm 1, we got 11 times 19 over 3, right? So that's a slightly different number than here. They're typically on the same order of magnitude. Okay? And really what I'm looking for is just the order of magnitude. Technically, there are theorems in linear algebra that tell you that all of the norms are sort of within certain reasonable uh, multiple of each other. Okay, so they're not super far away. And which one do you use is a matter of convenience depending on the problem you're solving. But so technically it doesn't matter, and I'll typically ask you, well, compute condition number in such and such norm because I want to test whether you remember how to compute certain norm. But overall it doesn't matter which one you pick. Now, what it really tells you, okay, this condition number tells you, okay. Let's say that I slightly change coefficients of my matrix. And if you remember, coefficients in like matrix like where I had like things going on in between different, um, they depend on these fluxes in between and certain conditions. So technically, you depend on how wide are your passages if you're passing points between buckets. Okay? So it tells you something physical about this system. Now, if I change the system slightly, I'm an engineer that is tuning this system. I'm wondering if I change this pipe so that it has slightly larger flux. How does that affect steady state solution through this entire system? In a good system, I would expect that it doesn't change things much. So my solution to this new system should be relatively close to the old. If a small, we call these small perturbations to the system, cause big changes or a bit of an unpredictable changes, then I don't have a well-designed system. Physically, there is something. And that's typically the case when you have, for instance, a really large flux here and a really small flux here that is kind of clogging things up. Okay? So then you enlarge one part and that's really not the, the playing well with the rest of the system in terms of ensuring a steady state flux. So basically, this difference in the solutions to those two closed systems divided by the initial ones is sort of a relative difference to the solution is bounded by the condition number of the matrix 
a norm of this difference divided by that. So relative change in the matrix itself. So for small condition numbers, okay, if this number is small, then a small change in matrix will induce a rather small change in the solutions. Does that make sense? So if I have a small condition number, and whether that's 10 or 20, it's not a big deal, okay? But whether it's 10 or 10 to the 6 is a big deal. Okay, so that's where actual, like, which norm you're using is not all that big problem, right? So it's really the order of magnitude of your condition number. So basically, systems are well designed if the condition matrix, uh, condition number of matrix A is relatively small. So here's one example where I'm really ill-conditioned. Okay. And let's actually open up MATLAB. So this is so-called van der Waalde matrix. This is one example. And this one is always rather badly conditioned, partly because you have huge differences. So let's say the next three is 10. You're going to have one here and 100 here. That starts causing issues. And here's another example here. So let's actually open up MATLAB and type in A and C from this example. So the only difference between A and C is 0.1, and it's here. Okay. So if I open up MATLAB, if my MATLAB, okay. So my A is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is my A. And if you actually want to use computer uh, to either do norm, you can say norm of A and then specify, okay, you can specify 1, 2, infinity, or so-called fro. This is Frobenius norm, for instance. Okay. So those are your options. You can do the same for condition number. So I would also do inverse of A, right? And for inverse of A, you can get this number will be really large. You can also use C on D, C on and D, that's condition number of A, and you can specify which norm. And basically, it's the mul multiplication of the previous two numbers. <coughs> so you have multiple options to do it in MATLAB. So this is large, okay? So this is bad. So let's actually see, so there's a suggestion here on the slide This is condition number and the norm. So this is for inverse of A and norm for A. You just type this, type A. Yeah. So this is if you want to test, like, what did you do by hand. This comes in handy. So let's actually now solve, and there's already a warning here that ma matrix is close to singular or badly scaled, so the results are rather inaccurate. So now if I try to solve the system, and here is a B here. B is 100, 8, and 10. Then if I start try solving, I'm going to call this x1 is a, b. I'll get x1 as a rather large number. Now let's try to type in c and solve the system that just has 9.1 here. 
So if I say x2 is C, so this is solution to the Cx is equal to B, I'm going to get the solution that is 17 minus 3. It's 14 orders of magnitude different. So this is what means a badly designed system. Pretty close. Can we, can we look at your Pretty picture? close. <laughs> In terms of universe, sure. <laughs> but petroleum engineering operations are on this earth, so you know. Sorry. <laughs> yes. That's part of the so that's part of the problem. Gill condition matrices well, but it is specified for yeah. um, So it's quite likely that if you notice when I co did the condition number. So this is my condition number. What are the different condition numbers that we get? Three point five. So part of it is like it has trouble computing it because matrix is nearly inverse of the matrix nearly doesn't exist. So if I had zero 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 as one of the rows, or one of the rows is a linear combination or close to a linear combination of the others, those are the matrices that are nearly singular. And it's extremely hard for it to compute inverse so that's not completely accurate. So there's numerical errors that creep in. So your computer is just doing something slightly different, and that's already causing a problem. So that's precisely what the collision means. <laughs> okay. So uh, either way, condition number the again importance is the order of it, and if it's that large, it's just bad. How bad? <laughs> Norm of A times norm of A inverse. But it, is, it has trouble computing A, A inverse, and it has numerical errors in that process. Yes? Is there a certain cutoff for you to say the condition number is too large versus too small? Is there a certain order magnitude? Uh, you can't <laughs> figure on it, really. Partly because there's a lot of issues computing it. But this is, this is the certainty is definitely about that. Alright. Yes. Oh, I'd say also it depends on your problem, okay? because it's not absolute in the sense that those coefficients of A, for instance, they depend on the units you chose, because if it's a physical system, it could be the same physical system, and you choose CGS versus metric system or something like that, you're going to have slightly different Right. They're going to be scaled, but, but that's also going to cause slight differences. So, yeah. And also, that's what a large difference in X, relatively speaking, is slightly different. I mean, those should scale out, but maybe they don't. And if they don't factor out of the computations, then they will cause slight differences. Okay, so overall, it's kind of depends on the problem. Yeah. I'd say 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, and now. Yeah. Okay. So, is our L2 norm in this case for Fabinius norm? No, L2 norm is not Fabinius norm. I was reading that Fabinius norm is classified as Euclidean norm, sort of. Sort of, it just looks like it, but it's not the same as. <laughs> it looks really similar, but it's not. Norm 2 is norm 2 maximum of where all of the vectors that have norm 2 1 go to. So they're mapped to a set, and I'm looking at the maximum of the norms of all of them. That's just the definition. And reasons are mathematical, so I'm not going to go into this. Okay. All right. So this is just a quick, actually, quick exercise. Let's say that I'm solving, finding polynomial f of x that has coefficients p1, p2, p3, p4, and p5. Okay. And I want that polynomial to fit completely 
the following data pairs. This is not a minus, this is just a list. So 200.746, 250.675, 300.745, 300 and so forth. How would you come up with the system of equations that these coefficients, p1, p2, p3, p4, p5, have been? So basically, if I plug in values, I'm going to have P1 times 200 to the 4, plus P2 times 200 to the 3, plus P3 times 200 to the 2, plus P4 times 200, plus P5 has to be equal to 0.746. Okay. Same thing for 250. So I plug in 250, F of 250 has to be this. Okay, so I'm going to have a linear equation in P1, P2, P3, P4, P5 for each of these points. Yes. So this is one way how we can actually solve this. This is called interpolation. So the problem with doing interpolation this way okay, is that you're going to get the matrix where you're going to have coefficients. So coefficients will be 200 to the 4, 200 to the 3, 200 to the square, so forth, and then same for 250, same for 300, 400, and 500, and those coefficients are really, they span from 500 to the 4 to 1, and that gives a really badly conditioned matrix. So that's actually an example of this so-called van der Mond matrix, because this is like having just like a larger version of this. Uh, so, technically, interpolation is not solved this way, though this is how we would come up with the system. Okay. So, you can actually do this example for yourself. Plug in this matrix, say, that is corresponding to this, and check what the condition number is. It's kind of big. Okay. This is a smaller version of the same problem. Okay, so even for 2 by 2, it doesn't really get better. Okay, so we have already, in this process, mentioned all of these uh, MATLAB built-in functions that you can use. Just a pretty powerful MATLAB tool is this solving for system. You don't know what type of solution is going to go on behind, is it goes to an elimination, is it something else? MATLAB decides for you. Inverse of A is right here. We actually learned how to do this by hand with LU decomposition. Norm of A, B, B can be 1, 2, infinity, or fro for pervenius. pervenius. Condition number, same thing. And LU decomposition matrix. You have to run it this way, and P will tell you if, it, if it's identity matrix, then there was no change of rows and columns going on to improve the accuracy. If P is not identity, then based on how P looks like, you can see which rows were interchanged and which columns were interchanged. <laughs> so it's not precisely the same result as what we did by hand. So would P be the inverse? No, L, this is for LU decomposition. L, A is equal to L times U. Okay, yes? I just have a question about LU decomposition. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're putting your coefficients into a lower matrix, and then, like, let's say, like, you're going to try to zero out, like, A, like, A22 or something, it doesn't change that condition number whenever you're zeroing it out. You will or never zero A22 or use A22 to zero out others.
so that shouldn't be. But technically, if you so if you multiply one row of your matrix by a thousand, just an entire row, then infinity norm of that matrix will become a thousand times bigger. If you if you precisely that row that maximizes the sum, that's the one multiplied by a thousand. That's going to change the condition of the right out. But if that happens in your system that you came up with, and you can avoid dividing by thousand, okay, uh, then basically yes, you're going to change the condition number slightly. And technically, you can improve your condition number slightly. Uh, what's often done, and that's called preconditioning, is finding. A good matrix to multiply your matrix with. So instead of solving AX is equal to B, you solve CAX is equal to CB. So you multiply both sides by C, matrix multiplication. And then you're hoping to prove the condition number of CA. That's called C condition. Yeah. So yes, you can modify condition number of your system by modifying the system slightly. Partly because if you're solving AX is equal to B, well, for any matrix C, this is the same, same X should be solving. This is a new matrix, this is a new vector. Okay. So you can improve the situation by judicious choice of C. So if your choice of C is good, you're going to improve this matrix, and you're going to improve the numerical solution. But it doesn't change X. It doesn't change X, and that's the whole point. Okay? But it improves your solution. And if that's the, again, in most of the solving PDEs and ODEs, you come up with these systems where you're typically changing the right hand side but you're not changing the matrix because that's the base coefficients that you're working with and boundary conditions are on this side. Huh? So if you know that you're going to solve this over and over it's worthwhile preconditioning it and cutting down <coughs> any kind of numerical inaccuracies. And again there's like people that's what they do in their PhD thesis, their preconditioning <laughs> systems that are of big importance. Like if you're operating an airplane and you're constantly solving the same system while operating that airplane, you kind of like, you know, over eight hours of a flight, you'd like to improve that. So obviously, if, if you have such a system, it's worth spending somebody's PhD thesis on improving. <laughs> okay. Same thing in reservoir. Uh, reservoir simulation again, especially when you're solving systems that are heavily So the P you say is added in the matrix, but so if it is, then your A is LU and there was no change of rows or columns going on. What is this? So what if this now? Like what should P look like? Then often, like if it basically in the process it flipped. It exchanged first and second columns, then you will have identity matrix whose first and second columns are reversed. So you know that that has some CP. What does that do to B? So you should then multiply B. Uh, changing column does nothing to B, but changing rows switches rows of B. Okay. So these were so-called direct methods for solving systems. Okay? Gaussian elimination was one of them. In general, Gaussian elimination, I already mentioned, there's a whole lot of numerical computation that goes. It's fairly expensive. And because of that, there's a whole lot of errors that the property. So typically, for large sets of equations, larger than 1,000, we don't use Gaussian elimination because it can cause a lot of numerical error. We use so-called indirect methods. <laughs> indirect methods are so-called iterative methods. Okay? So I start with a guess. On the next step, I improve my guess. 
on the next step I improve my guess. And I keep improving until when? What do you know about numerical methods by now? When do I stop iterating? I figure out error. What is my error? Okay, but I have a vector solution. A norm of a vector. So I'm not, not, not going to use absolute value of two numbers. And so I have a vector in my previous step, a vector in my next step. I'm going to do difference of those vectors. Norm of the difference. Vector norm. Divided by a vector norm of my latest guess. And that's going to be my relative here. So again, any iterative solution, any method that kind of starts with a guess and then improves upon that guess, stops when two guesses are close enough. And I use norms to determine whether something is close enough. So again, I gotta use instead of just in, in my root finding, I was looking for one root. Okay, so I can just go difference between two numbers divided by absolute values. But here I have a vector solution. I'm looking for a vector. So instead of absolute values, I'm gonna use norms. Wherever I had absolute values, it's gonna be a norm. Normal your choice. Again, they're all relatively close, they're not precisely the same, but it's a normal here. One, infinity, two. Okay. So basically, that's it. Now, how do we come up with methods? Okay. So if I actually look at this system, this is a four by four system. Okay. I can actually go and say, uh-huh, x1, I'm going to express x1 here. Okay. x1 is b1 minus basically this sum, okay, and then divided by a11. That's basically finding what x1 is from here. Okay. In the second one, I express x2, I express x3, and then x4 from the fourth one, and I get something like this. Okay. Well, this actually suggests this suggests what I could use to iterate towards a solution. Okay? And it's called the Jacobi method. So what Jacobi method does, okay, I'm going to skip convergence criteria and come back to it afterwards. So what Jacobi method does, okay, it actually starts from a guess. Okay, and then I plug in that guess. So that guess will have if I'm in a 4 by 4, it's going to have four numbers. Let's say 0, 0, 0. Okay. I'm going to plug in zeros here. Okay. All of the equations on the right-hand side. And that's going to give me my next guess, my next x. Then I'm going to use these x's, plug them in here, get my next guess, and I keep going. Okay. And then now it's a good question, will that work? We're going to get to it in a second, but let's try it out first. So basically, formally, mm -hmm. is that so a one in x order? Yes. Oh, sorry. This was taken. This is a picture from a textbook that actually had a typo. Oh. <laughs> so it's not my typing. This is a four one here. Okay. So in general, basically, these are my next guesses and these are my old guesses, right? So based on that algorithm, I can keep going and keep computing. Let's give it a try by hand first, okay? So here's an example, three by three problem, not four by four, just to make, so go by hand, okay? So my system is right here. Yes, you can use these equations, but basically just don't use the fourth one, right? Don't use the fourth one and don't use anything that has four in there. You'll be good. So start with the zero or initial guess is zero, zero, zero. And compute what's going to be x1, x2, x3. So your next x for step one 
and then use that step one to compute step two. So let's go two steps to see that we understand. So x to, it's basically, I plug in zeros here, I put it on the other side, but there's nothing to compute, right? So it's 7.85 divided by 3, right? Same thing if I was plugging it into here, it would be 7.85 minus this sum here, right? And then divided by 3. So what does that come down to? Two point six two. All right. Now this x two again, same thing. Minus nineteen point three. This is just a zero divided by seven. So this first one is really easy. Okay. And then I express x three here. It's this minus this sum divided by ten, which in this case is seven point one four. Okay. So I can already see that seven point one four is kind of close to seven. Two point sixty two is not too far away from three. Now on the next, I would improve on that. Did anybody get that far? So now if I have three new numbers, that's my x, this is what I refer to as x1, okay, vector. That vector has three values, okay? So now that I have these three values, okay, I would plug them in here and again express x1. Whatever it is that you got as x1, you have three values in there, x1, x2, x3. You plug that into this formula. So you use them here. Okay? With the coefficients for matrix A. And that gives you your next guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I was asking, so then whenever you get to the next one, the second line, you're talking about x2, then you're for x1, you 
Okay, sorry about that. Wow. Wow. That was nice. I stopped the phone call. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. 
Right, so that's like six months. Well, I've got the slope right, so it's hard to eyeball. Right, but the, I wouldn't like yeah. the slope. Yeah. If I see that you wrote the, you you did did the slope, you did the slope. Like, <laughs> that, that, that's not going to be that cool. It's just. What I was asking you like a minute ago was about <laughs> LED composition. But basically, like, what I was saying is if, for instance, I wanted to, like, I got this number. So basically what I'm saying is if I want to clear out this this for the sake of argument, this value here, and I actually used a uh, coefficient that was like greater than one, it's fine or something to clear that out here instead of the big slide. So So that would be change this coefficient. This no. coefficient. That coefficient was recorded before. Okay. So just because you wrote it in there, normally we actually don't write it in this matrix. We record it separately. No, like one thing so you don't think that you need to change it. Okay. Well, the one thing I kind of saw when I was doing this is that you don't want to change. Like whatever your LUD, LUD composition, you just want to focus on the matrix A itself and not augment it. Right. Because right. if you do, then you, you Because augmented aug is not part of it. You're doing LUD composition of A. Yeah. B has nothing to do with it. B comes in later. Because like if you're trying to use some different B solutions later, you have to do all those operations on B each time. If you Precisely, but that's what we are doing. We are doing LUD composition of A separately, and then involving B because I know I'm going to change B ten times. And there's like certain rules that you can't do, like in Gaussian elimination. If you augment it, it's okay to multiply a row times a number. But in LUD composition, it's not okay to multiply a row times a number if it's like not outside of the subtraction, like when you're subtracting. Right. Because right. that'll that'll change like one side of the equation versus right. the other side. Versus like, not the other. Yeah. But you you you. That I wasn't. I, that I wasn't. I didn't follow that. That question was related to LUD composition. Yeah. You didn't tell me that. I know. Part. I didn't. Tell you that. <laughs> I, didn't for that. I was like, generally in the system, if you multiply, you multiply the well, round. Well, I've other <laughs> Right. Uh, but you're saying like I'm, I'm, I'm working on reading the minds, but I'm not, <laughs> not there yet. My algorithm keeps improving. <laughs> um, but I was also wondering, you said that it's okay if you use like a matrix saying, this is, that I augmented it and tried it, and that's how I found out that you couldn't augment it. So that's what this is here. But you said that you can change the columns of matrix A and it won't change the... I could flip the columns. What that does, it flips what is x2, what is x3. But is, will it be the same answer for x if you do that? B. No, it's going to have flipped x, but b in itself doesn't need to change. Oh, so it'll change the answer. Yeah, you asked me whether b changes. and No, b doesn't change if you put columns of a. Well, it'll change x. Yes. The so, x uh, so whatever you called x1 is going to be x2. Whatever you called x2 is going to be x1. If you flip the first and second column. And we sometimes do that to it's called full pivoting. There's partial pivoting is when you just flip rows, different rows. Um, full pivoting is when you flip columns as well. And like to get that coefficient to the largest number possible. To pivot. But when you do pivoting, pivoting's just like zeroing out above and below, right? Yeah, that's the full pivoting. And what was partial pivot? No, no, partial, no, no, pivot number, pivot, is the pivot is the position that you use to modify others. Right. Partial, pivoting itself is switching rows, partial pivoting. Full pivoting is switching rows or switching columns, depending on what's coming in. But you really can't do that unless it's an augmented matrix, because they're going to change too much. Yeah, pivoting we do. Though when it's done, it's recorded in this P that is passed to the algorithm, so then you know so that you need to change. The computer does do it. Yeah. Okay. To improve the numerical part, because the errors could be rather large. Because it, so MATLAB is so advanced that it just does that automatically, again, because numerical errors can be significant. And there's that example in the homework where you had something. whatever it is, and then there was here it was number. Okay? So if you have this in the pivot position, it's going to kill your numerics. And if you, if you keep only four significant digits or whatever we did there, basically you're going to get vastly different. Because rounding up is so bad 
Why? Because you have to divide by this. You're dividing by a very small number so in order to get rid of this. But you're saying like we can use this method here where we multiply this times like a thousand. So we can multiply this equation by a thousand and then multiply it b by a thousand, which wouldn't change x, but we would get like whole numbers. That's another possibility, yes. And you would remove issues, but instead of, sometimes like when you just do LU decomposition, computer doesn't know, so it's not going to multiply by a thousand. It's going to maybe switch rows and so overall what's built into algorithms is that it's just going to flip these two positions. Uh, may I have a quick question? Uh -huh. uh, so do you want me to give an office hour to them an extra office hour? Hmm? Uh, do, do you want me to give them an extra office hour? Okay, if I, yeah, maybe, but, well, if we can, maybe both of us can show up, or yeah. at least one of us. Yeah. So I maybe, think if we do it on Sunday, both of us will be busy. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I have this feeling. Okay. Yeah. So, so maybe, would, would that be a problem on Sunday yeah. afternoon? Yeah. It will be fine. Okay. So maybe we'll let's count on five o'clock, and I'm gonna okay. make my best. Yes. Yeah, so just uh, so just send them the notification, and I'll yeah, come. there will be office hours in the lounge. Yeah. And, and okay. it's like while like the errors, like if I'm using like an absolute value of like x mm -hmm. minus x in my own. Um, I had a couple questions about this. Does the error need to be less than like the EPS value or greater than? Because I have like no. Well, error is greater than. It's greater than, but up here it says. Um, the approximate relative error is less than the specified tolerant TPS. Right. So it's going to stop when that error is less. <laughs> while loop is going to keep going while error is bigger. The well, first it. time it's less, it's going to stop, and that's your error. And then I had a question about this function, like G function. Um, mm -hmm. G, I assume the function G fun that corresponds to the right hand side of the equation G of X. So, like, I was wondering when I use G function, do I need, like, I don't know how G function is written. So. Yeah, but it's probably, it's G of X. So you give it an X and it's going to compute something. So this is correct. Okay. You're going to give it a guess and it's going to give you something back. Okay. Awesome. That's it. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>